Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today is Peter J. Betke, University Professor of Economics and Philosophy at George Mason University, the BB&T Professor for the Study of Capitalism, and the Director of the F.A. Hayek Program for the Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He's also a former president of the Mount Pelerin Society. He is the author of many books. The most recent is The Struggle for a Better World. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Pete. Thanks. It's great to be here with you. So I'd like to start with something more autobiographical that you mentioned uh, in a later essay in the book, uh, Remarks to the Mount Pelerin Society, about your teacher at Grove City College, Hans Sinholtz. So what did uh, Dr. Sinholtz uh, teach you that you still carry with you to this day? That's a great question. Uh, you know, in many ways, uh, almost everything. Um, he, uh, he totally changed my life. Um, I was uh, not at all interested in becoming an economist uh, or a scholar. I, I my goal was to become a high school basketball coach, and uh, he totally, uh, you know, transformed me by introducing me to the world of economics. Now, you know, as I was prepared to learn, because the summer before I went to Grove City College, I worked um, digging pools, and uh, you know that there's two things about that job which stick out. One of which is that it was in the middle of the gas shortages in the late 1970s. And I was the youngest person uh, on the crew. I, in fact, got the job uh, because uh, there were older guys at the playground that had told me about this job that they worked at, you know, and so that's why I ended up by working there and they made a lot of fun of me, you know, college boy, blah, 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 these things like that. And so I had to siphon the gasoline you know, from one, you know, and, and that's a terrible job if anyone ever gets given that. And, uh, and you could imagine, you know, a 17 year old, you know, sucking on a tube to get gasoline from one to another, uh, with a bunch of high testosterone males, uh, you know, enjoying the hilarity of this situation, uh, you know, and so, you know, it was just, it was, it's, I hated the gas lines because I didn't want to be doing that. So that's one. Second is that at the end of the summer, when I went to quit my job to get ready to, to go to school, um, you know, I had told the guy there that I was going to leave uh, to go, you know, get ready. And uh, I went to get my paycheck uh, the last time, you know, so there's always a delay, right? In the, you get paid, you know, on a two week thing like that, like that. And so I went to see him and, uh, you know, for, I won't go into the, the gru gruesome details here, but he paid me in cash and then he grabbed my hand and he said, oh, I got to take withholding out. Now, again, remember I was just a kid. So all summer long, I've been getting a check that had already taken withholding out, but I didn't even really know that it was withholding. It's just, this is what I got paid. But now he paid me all the cash out. And then he grabbed my hand and then took it. And I'll never forget, he didn't take it and put it back, you know, where he got the cash from. He put it right into he his pocket. put it pocket. in his pocket. Yeah, yeah. I was predicting that. <laughs> and, so, and so to me, I was like, oh, my God, this is like thievery. But I, I got out of Dodge there because it was a sketchy kind of place to begin with in New Jersey. And I didn't want to be involved with it. But I had in the back of my head this idea that. Uh, you know, the gas lines were terrible and that somehow this withholding taxes were really thieving from my money that I had. And so here I am in the, in the back of an economics classroom. And in the first week, Senholtz is explaining, you know, why it is there's gas shortages in America. And it's because of the government, you know, and, and setting the prices the way they did and everything like that. And I was like, oh, so I had like now an object of my anger that I could focus on. And then a few weeks later, he was talking about, you know, basically the welfare state and taxation. He described it as a giant circle in which we all had our hands in the pockets of our neighbors and we were taking and taking and taking. So now now, all of a sudden, you know, the withholding and the taking, and I'm like, ah, and that's the same culprit that caused it. <laughs> and so that changed my whole worldview, and it coincided with Milton Friedman's Free to Choose coming out. And so I went from reading Henry Hazlitt and, you know, Senholtz's lectures to then reading, you know, uh, Milton Friedman. And, you know, that book is, is so punchy and, you know, condensed with so much great information. And the PBS series is involved. And, you know, so my whole world changes. And, 
just a, a, a few years ago, my aunt, my brother's sister passed away. And when she passed away, uh, you know, various different materials from her, you know, stock of materials got sent to my brother. And then my brother, you know, gave them to me. And one of them was a letter that I had written my father, you know, when I was off at college at Grove City. And you got to remember again, like I had never shown any inclination to be academic or anything like that. All I cared about was sports. And my, my letter to my father is all about economics. It's all about, you know, what I'm learning in economics. And then there's like a paragraph about how sports are going. And I remember thinking at the time, my father must have thought like, what the hell happened to my son? You know, he like, he went away to college and disappeared, but uh, he shared it with my aunt, uh, I guess, to show my maturation. So yeah, uh, that's uh, Senholtz. Senholtz then introduced me to these set of ideas, but then he also, more importantly, got me involved in reading. And uh, the way Senholtz taught economics was through the his lectures, which were more like public lectures, because he traveled all over the country giving public lectures. So his, his classes weren't like course lectures. They were more like the way you would get a chicken dinner talk at like, say, a banquet for today, we would call it the Bastiat Society or something like that. And so they were they were more engaging than that. And I just, you know, completely was enamored by it. But then he also uh, pointed us to read. So, you know, I, I already mentioned Henry Hazlitt and, 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 and Friedman, but, you know, early on I had read Mises' Socialism because Liberty Fund had published the book. And so we read that. Um, and, you know, he, he taught his economics through the history of economic ideas. So reading that and in the original text. So we had to read Adam Smith in the wealth of nations. We had to read Karl Marx's capital. You know, we had to read John Maynard Keynes's general theory. And that's the way he taught economics. He taught it economics. It, it wasn't like I was, I thought I was learning history of economic thought. I thought I was learning economics and this is just the way you did it. And he, he focused his criticisms, the critical dialogue was between the free market guys, you know, from Adam Smith to Hayek, uh, against the uh, Marx, Veblen, Keynes, and Galbraith. So by the time I was a senior, I had read, you know, basically almost every book Galbraith had published and, you know, uh, Keynes, The General Theory, Marx. And then on the other side, we would read uh, you know, it, it was mainly, you know, Adam Smith, John Baptiste Say, um, and then uh, uh, Bombavric. So he, he was a translator of Bombavric. So that was a big thing for him. So we worked our way through capital and interest in Bombavric and then uh, Mises. And then he would always hold a special disdain for Mill and for Hayek who he considered leakers, the great leakers of the classical liberal tradition, and that they gave too much space for the Marx, the Keynes, or the Marx, the Veblen, the Keynes, and the Galbraiths. Yeah, this and idea so that Hayek was too nice. Yeah, that you get that. Yeah, you Hayek get that was from, too nice. Yeah. yeah, and so then, you know, and, and, and in the meantime, while he, that was the education he was giving me, since I had, was reading all these people, I got really excited about reading basically – you know, Austrian economics in more depth. So Menger's principles book was uh, made available through uh, NYU press while I was a grad student. One of the, the uh, older students was in New York, brought me back a copy. I can remember reading it. Like, you know, it was the greatest thing in the world and uh, Rothbart. So, and then, and then reading Murray Rothbart. Now it's the Murray Rothbart that uh, your readers and listeners wouldn't know. It's the Murray Rothbard from the 1950s to 1970. Um, and so to me, the pinnacle of Rothbard, besides man, economy, and state, in which, you know, basically I learned a ton of my economics from that, because at that time, me, reading Mises and, and dissecting Mises as human action was probably a little bit beyond where I was at in the world, but Rothbard made it very, so Rothbard became the main text. But his book, For a New Liberty, is really what kind of framed. So I think about going from free to choose and then thinking that's not radical enough, right? And so then I, you know, and, and Rothbard's For a New Liberty really captured 
the period of time in which I was learning these ideas, which is in the late 70s, early 80s, um, because Rothbard book originally came out in the early 70s, but it resonated with my whole like growing up, right, of, you know, the Vietnam War and the, and the uh, failure of that and the corruption of government, let's say, and not only Nixon, but Agnew and, you know, these kind of issues at the time. And uh, then the stagflation of the 70s and, and then the also social issues. So Rothbard really hammered home the idea that there was a sphere of activity that in, is the right of the individual that the state has no play in of who we love and how we love and, you know, what we inject or ingest into our bodies and, uh, you know, the choices over our own self-ownership. And I just completely, you know, I, I, I'll shut up after this, but let me tell you one other story. I, I didn't know how to read. Again, you know, I was a, a kid, so now I'm in college and I'm finally now caring about whether my grades are okay or not, right? And so I figure, okay, I got to start learning how to highlight. But I didn't really know how to highlight. This is going to sound stupid to your readers because I had never done it before when I was in high school or anything like that. So when I first was highlight, I didn't know what to highlight. Like I just didn't know. So then what I did was I decided, you know, I ended up by highlighting everything. And then I was like, well, that doesn't help. You know, like whole paragraphs and everything like that. You know, that doesn't help. So then I tried all kinds of different hacks, you know, learning hacks. And so then I came up with the idea, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to only underline in red in squiggly letters, those like a line like this, only those things that I disagree with. And it's right at that time that I read for the first time for New Liberty. So I start picking up the book. I start reading. I start reading, waiting for me to draw a little squiggly line. I got all the way to the end. I made no highlights, no squiggly line, because I completely was. And so at that point in my life, say 20 years old or whatever, I was a complete 100% like I'm Rothbard square, you know, Mises set the stage, Rothbard finished the stage, and this is the, the, the Rothbard. And so by the time I got to be a senior in college and was considering graduate school, you know, I, I, I was interested in these ideas. And, and, and it's important to keep in mind that I had read, you know, Marx, Veblen, you know, Keynes and, and Galbraith. And so one of the very first papers I ever read and, uh, you know, wrote and published academic papers was this paper that was motivated by Rothbard's 70s appeal to the new left. And now I was trying to address this issue about why is economics not an evolutionary science? And is the Austrians like a way that they can actually be the fulfillment of this evolutionary science? The person I sent that paper to was Murray Rothbard. You know, I sent it to him and I said, you know, because when I decided to go to graduate school at George Mason University, my alternative, you know, I, you know, NYU was on the table, Auburn's on the table, all those are there. But my alternative really in my head at the time was going to the Center for Libertarian Studies in New York City because Rothbart was giving a series of lectures, which later became his history of thought book. And it was like, I actually didn't understand academics. So I was like, Maybe I should study with Rothbard, you know, as an independent scholar, you know, kind of thing. And so I wrote to him and nothing. I didn't get anything back. And then eventually, you know, about six months later, I'm in graduate school and he's giving a series of lectures in D.C. and at, at the Mises Institute, which used to have a, a, a headquarters in D.C. They, they just opened it up. And I went down to see him give the lectures and I went out to dinner with him. Amazingly charming man. Again, you know, it's it's hard to capture to younger people because of all the stuff that's gone in between. But, you know, within five minutes of meeting him, you're calling him Murray, you know, you're plotting for the world revolution with him. It's a totally different kind of thing. He, he's a different person. So he says to me, you know, now again, the fact that he then sat and sat with me and talked for hours afterwards, but he, his first words to me was, I have a scathing review of that article of yours, you know? And, and I said, why? I said, it's motivated by you. And, you know, your attempt to reach out to the new left and his argument is, just, yeah, that didn't work. <laughs> and so, so he's trying to tell me not to, you know, focus on that. But that's the Rothbard that I was influenced by, the kind of, you know, very radical libertarian uh, kind of social 
uh, not socially conservative, but instead, you know, socially welcoming, you know, immigrate, free immigration, open borders, uh, you know, drug legalization, uh, you know, sexual freedom, uh, uh, pro-choice, all of these positions, which are extremely relevant even for today. And to me, I think this is the key aspects of what a radical libertarian position is. And I came to that position, you know, as a kid, and I think of myself more as a social scientist than a libertarian activist, but clearly all my priors are still, you know, grounded in that, in those same positions. And, you know, I think a lot of critics of libertarianism today, um, you know, would be shocked by those positions because, but to me, that's like the true position that libertarianism is an emancipatory doctrine. It's a doctrine about overcoming all forms of power and privilege, including the business elite, right, who are wedded to the state and everything like that. I mean, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations is a criticism of mercantilism, which is this, you know, and so it's all about eradicating these barriers uh, to the ability of ordinary individuals to live free lives. And, and, you know, that's the key thing. And that's always been what's promising to me. So the uh, interesting thing too, is that Sinholtz's uh, PhD advisor, I believe was Mises, correct? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is, which brings in this kind of lineage, which I find interesting because uh, many of your PhD students are friends of mine. um, And uh, you, it's sort of like a generational thing where it goes from Mises to Sinholtz to you, to people like, you know, Dan D'Amico, Leah Polagashvili, people like that. Now that fits in the Misesian tradition where you were educated. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that this has been always a kind of an unusual uh, aspect of the sociology of modern Austrian economics is that, you know, my education is through my core education is through, you know, Don Lavoy, whose lineage is through Israel Kirzner and Israel's Kirzner traces back to, to Mises. And my actual direct teacher was Hans Senholtz, who was also a student directly to Mises. And so, you know, my, I grew up, you know, in the Misesian tradition and understanding that I, I it, it's that, that tradition, I see that um, Hayek is in that same tradition, just like Machlup and others that trace back to his Viennese days. And so I don't see it as these sort of dividing lines, the way that the internet has taken it or the way the story has evolved. And, you know, so I, 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 in general, I don't really, in gen, in, in general, I don't really think that that conversation is that productive. So that's why I haven't really spent a lot of time except in internet scribbles, which used to like flare up here and there or whatever. Um, but I, I do think there's a Rothbardian tradition and that there are Rothbardians, but Rothbardians are not necessarily Misesians and they're certainly not necessarily seen you know, for sure, Austrian economics is a progressive research program in which you don't really label it after any one individual, but it's like a conglomeration of a series of ideas, which we're all trying to work with and develop in our own way and going forward. And so it's a set of methodological uh, and analytical propositions about the way that an economist engages in their craft. Um, And, uh, you know, to me, that's what, you know, I'm a professional economist. I try to do good economics. To me, you know, to do good economics means that you have to actually follow certain, you know, uh, methodological and analytical approaches uh, to answer the questions that I care about that I think are essential for us to be able to understand the world. And to me, the Austrian tradition, not exclusively, but in a major way, made major advances in methodological uh, arguments and analytical arguments about how we should study the world. So that's what I want to do. Yeah. Well, in that, it, so we have that kind of actual human lineage, but it's also connected to one of the ideas that you've discussed a lot and you discuss in the book, which is mainstream versus mainline economics. Uh, what is that distinction that you make? And then the second is, is, is it just, is it, is it just, is, is it Austrians who picked up the main line? I mean, almost exclusively. So, so I don't think so. Mainstream. But I'll explain in a minute. Uh, I, so that is uh, – so first of all, I get this distinction um, and the notion of mainline economics from one of my other teachers, a man named Kenneth Boulding, who in a wonderful essay called After Samuelson, Who Needs Smith? Uh, 
And his argument is that we all do because Samuelson didn't exhaust what Smith has to offer us. And so the question is, is can I draw a line from Adam Smith to the kind of questions today? And that would be the main line of economics. So developing that idea in my own unique way, I started thinking about um, what what is it that <laughs> here's how my mind works. This is kind of a funny thing is that I imagine a Martian coming to Earth. And the Martian comes to Earth in the year 1780 and sa- and meets someone and says, you know, I'm an economist. Well, what would they think that person believed? And then if they came in 1820, oh, I'm an economist. What would they think that that person believed? And then they came in 1890 and they said, oh, I'm an economist. What would that person believe? But then what happens when they come in like 1940 and someone says an economist? And then they're like, huh. That doesn't seem like, you know, the other people that were there before, right? So that's the kind of ideas that that somehow, and so what I wanted to explain was that there's a main line of economics, which is derived from the idea that we live in a world of scarcity, uh, that individuals make choices against constraints. And ultimately what we have is we have two fundamental propositions, the invisible hand proposition about the self-regulating powers of the market, and we have the rational choice postulate. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to square the rational choice postulate with the invisible hand. But the way the mainline people did was always they did it via institutions, which is they relied on the institutions of property, contract, and consent to be able to funnel the ordinary motives of individuals to be able to realize social cooperation among each other, right? Now, other people did this by collapsing one to the other, you know, by making very strong cognitive assumptions for mathematical tractability. Well, that's not what Adam Smith was doing, but that is what like Valras was doing. And so that's that's different. Um, On the other hand, there's other people who simply denied it, like Keynes in the end of laissez-faire. He says, there is no... Uh, invisible hand. Uh, There is no rationality of the individuals. And so he cut the legs out from underneath the two propositions. All right. And so, but that's not what Adam Smith was arguing either. So what is it that Adam Smith argued? Adam Smith didn't argue that individuals pursuing their self-interest under any conceivable set of circumstances will generate a publicly desirable outcome. It was always within specific institutional context having to do with the rules of property, contract, and consent. And so It's that focus on the institutional framework within which economic activity takes place um, that is what is the connection between the political economy thinkers from Adam Smith all the way up to Vernon Smith. And so I try to draw that line. My argument is, is that that's the main line of economics. And then what happens is mainstream is whatever is currently fashionable. And so when the mainstream deviates from the main line, various aspects of the main line rise up as schools of thought to try to pull the mainstream back to the main line. So the Austrians are at the core of this because they were recognizing the idea that economics is about exchange and the institutions within which exchange takes place. And they were fighting that battle right as people were trying to treat economics as formal properties of equilibrium, okay? But they weren't the only ones. So, you know, earlier non-Ricardian British economists, such as Philip Wicksteed, was trying to port, put forth an exchange paradigm kind of approach. And, of course, Bishop Waitley argued for the catalactic view and these things like that. And then after, you know, the Austrians, in some sense, Armin Alchin, you know, bringing back property rights economics or... Jim Buchanan bringing back the fact that economic life exists inside of politics and we have to study politics and Ronald Coase emphasizing that we have to think about the legal environment in which these things are organized. And so law, economics, uh, political, public choice, and property rights economics go side and side with market process economics to be part of the mainline tradition in economics. And there's roots that are connected, that have been forgotten by a lot of people in those schools of thought, which, you know, I've spent a lot of time trying to unearth archivally and demonstrate or whatever. But the reality is, is that like for an economist today, you know, that might not care about the history of economic ideas, what I'm trying to ask them to think about is the consilience 
between law and economics, property rights economics, public choice economics, new institutional economics in general, and Austrian economics, and to see those as part of a broad research program, which is challenging the hegemonic view of economics as a version of mathematical economics, let's say, um, or a version of, of, you know, that economics is statistics. And so, you know, it's, it's basically fighting a variety of, of intellectual battles in the science of economics about how to do economics. Um, and, and it's all because I want to try to understand social cooperation and division of labor and how economic life exists within political, legal, and cultural context, and that it's these political, legal, and cultural context that either hinder or help in the achievement of social cooperation and division of labor. Does that mean there's something wrong with with math econ kind of inherently? Uh, I mean, equilibrium theory, the kind of equations that you would learn in your standard econ class if we're not using your textbook, for example, <laughs> is, is there just yeah. a, is there a tendency? Does it, does it, does it, inevitably pull to quantification and statistics and econometrics and all yeah. these kind of big number theories as opposed to focusing on human action uh, to coin a phrase. Yeah. So I don't, I, I wouldn't necessarily go that far because I think mathematical reasoning can be very valuable on various margins. Uh, the way that, uh, you know, uh, Marshall used to talk about this was that, you know, mathematics is a very good servant. It's a very bad master. Um, the problem is, is that for a variety of sociological reasons, and I would argue deep philosophical reasons, which you know maybe we don't want to go into here, but uh, we ended up by uh, you know making a kind of Faustian bargain where we cared more about tractability than we did about intelligibility. And once we made that move, we were prone to excessive formalism and excessive empiricism. So the note of the term there is excessive because we all want rigorous arguments. Economics is grounded in logic and logical reasoning. The difference is, I am going to go into the philosophical issues. The, the classical economist Please to, the, to the contemporary Austrians wanted to derive logically sound theories. Okay, now... The problem with logical soundness, all right, that is, is if the premise is true and the logical deductions are in fact correct, then the conclusions are in fact true. Um, it didn't have an easy sorting mechanism between competing claims about logically sound theories. So people were, were constantly debating issues, you know, throughout the years. Economics is a series of debates, technical debates. Um, and, um, and, and so, you know, we thought that, oh, those debates are unresolvable because we're using natural language, right? And, and the problem with the ambiguity of natural language. So what we need to do is, is the greatest confusion is when we use the same words to mean different things or different words to mean the same thing. So mathematics gets rid of that. But once we got mathematics into the picture, what we had to recognize is that we were giving up on logical soundness. And instead, we were deriving logically valid models. Now, we had an overconfidence because we thought as the evolution of statistical techniques rose up, our testing procedures would be unambiguous. And then we could sort from the array of logically valid models those that are empirically relevant. But the problem was is that even in physics, there's a thing called the duham quine thesis, which is that even in physics you know, the testing is ambiguous at best. It's not unambiguous. Well, so what that means is that you lose the sorting mechanism. And when you lose the sorting mechanism, you get stuck with these toy economies and no way to sort between them. And so we gave this Faustian bargain to somehow give us precision. And we got a certain flawless precision, but that also meant that we became less and less relevant to solving the world out the window. And so think about things like entrepreneurship, uh, you know, right? I mean, just simple kind of discoveries of various things. You know, you can't explain in the formal model the creativity and cleverness of someone like a Malcolm McLean, 
who, you know, recognized that the longshoremen were taking as long to unload and load as the boats were or the trucks were to deliver the goods to the ports or, or to the market. And so then he thought of containerization, you know, and the idea that you could have flatbed trucks and you could have the boats, you know, repurposed in that way and you just have the full containers. And that way you don't have to have the longshoremen spending three days to unload and three days to load. So you have a six days and you cut the cost down. All of a sudden that opens up, you know, world trade, right? And so where is that coming from? That's coming from this recognition or all the kind of ideas that Julian Simon had about that the ultimate resource is the human imagination. And so what we want to study, and again, this relates to our broader notion of what economics is about, is that, you know, Adam Smith did not invent the butcher, the baker, or the brewer. He didn't have to invent the common woolen coat that ended up on the back of the day labor. He's trying to philosophically understand an already existing phenomena. That view of economics is from the inside out, not the economist standing from the outside looking down and fixing a machine that's perhaps broken or whatever. And so the, the, the error of economics as being viewed from the outside in makes perfect sense to focus on these tools of control right, which is mathematics and statistical measurements and things like that. Whereas if you think about economics as putting an emphasis on the clever and creative actors that populate the economies that we study, all right, how ordinary people can do extraordinary things if just given the freedom, rather than thinking about how extraordinary people can do extraordinary things if just given the power to control you, right, that kind of approach to economics leads in one direction which I argue is the mainline direction. And the other one, the mainstream, is what's ever currently fashionable. And at some times, the mainstream aligns with the mainline. Adam Smith to John Stuart Mill, basically. All right? Or, you know, the rise of, say, the counter-revolution to Keynesianism in the, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, where a lot of these ideas came back into the forefront. But a lot of other times, it deviates. And it relates a lot to this idea of, do I see economics from the inside out or do I see economics from the outside in? Sometimes when I look at things like equilibrium theory, which even when I first learned that in my econ class, it struck me as kind of odd because it seemed to be very much in a test tube. Yeah. Like you would have to, you know, perfect competition. There are no profits. The, there, there's a market is completely cleared. And you wonder where that where that actually happens. But then it occurred to me that maybe the the value of something like equilibrium theory is similar to the value of studying physics in a frictionless universe. When we, we can analyze the path of a ball thrown by Tom Brady and we can use all the physics things to say, okay, here's where the ball's going to land. But in the real world, the ball will never land there unless we can take every single thing into account. So, I mean, does, does Austrian econ and kind of stepping back outside of the system, just add noise into the equilibrium and trying the, the standard equilibrium model and trying to understand the model hey. With no so I think it's a yeah. little different than that, but that's one way in which people could talk about it. But I think, it, it, you know, the first thing is to think about it, it, what's in the background and what's in the foreground of your explanation to the world. So I'm going to use a weird example to start, but I, I think it relates. You'll see in a second. So uh, in the movie Harry Potter, uh, when Harry is learning how to play uh, Quidditch, if you remember that what happens, he falls once and breaks his arm. And there's this kind of weird wizard that is goofy and always, you know, sort of everyone's worried about the spells that he does. But he comes over and says, I'll fix your arm, Harry. And he goes, bit of a right. And then he, what he does, he eliminates all the bones from Harry's arm. So now Harry's arm doesn't have a broken bone, but it has no bones. So what does it do? It just hangs there like this. That's economic theory without equilibrium <laughs> as a background, okay? It's just like an amorphous mess. It has nothing there. The, the issue, the way to think about it is that the equilibrium optimality conditions are like the skeleton. And then what you need to do is put on top of the skeleton the ligaments and the muscles and everything like that to be able to make the theory work. And it's those ligaments and muscles and everything like that that the Austrians are talking about. So the skeleton has to be there always in the background. The problem with a lot of standard economics is that they flipped it. And so in the background is the story they might tell a student about market clearing in a principles class. But when they write down the system of equation, there is no process of market clearing. It's simultaneous equations, which is the way. So all it is is a dot. 
boom, there it is. There's a P and Q space that clears the market, right? And so, or, you know, how is it that information is acquired? Well, who cares? What matters is that there's an informational threshold. There's an information space that they have to have to be able to have the precondition of the optimality conditions. So a lot of this is, this is, gets confused in a, in a certain way because Austrian economics is not non-mainstream economics. It is not not neoclassical economics. It's a branch of neoclassical economics. And, and it's not heterodox economics in the same way that, you know, uh, Marxism is or old institutionalism or uh, post-Keynesianism Keynesianism is um, because it believes in methodological individualism, you know, choice against constraints. It's just that the emphasis and, and it believes in the systematic interconnectedness of the equilibrium propositions. It's just that the way they explain how you go from one to the other is filled with this idea of the, the, the various things. So let me give you an example that's from Daniel Hausman, the philosopher of economics um, at University of Wisconsin, Madison. So he, building on Mill's idea, describes economics as the inexact science. And, um, and, and let me just back up for a second. It's important to remember that Menger distinguished in economics between exact theory, empirical realistic theory, and economic history. That is the Austrian methodology. There's exact theory, which is the pure ratio nation of the logic of choice. And then there's empirical... Re you mean like the, pri the price goes up and consumption goes down? Yeah, uh, your individual would decision. Be, yeah. And, and, yeah. and so your marginal benefit, marginal cost calculus, okay? And then you have the empirical realistic theory, which is that logic of choice played out in a world with other logical choosers and rules that govern your interaction between you and them and nature. And that... that determines how it what's rational in certain environments and the combination of the pure lot so that's the pure logic of choice translates into uh, uh, situational logic when we throw them into this institutional filter the combination of those two things is what provides the intellectual eyeglasses for reading history now okay so that institutional empirical realistic part that's where you bring in politics law, and social and cultural mores, because they shape. And even think about someone like Bombavrik explaining, you know, the horse market, the way in which the horse market, the equilibrium that emerges in the horse market is going to depend on the rules that govern the auction over the, over the delivery of the horses, right? So, <clears throat> so Mill explained this in reference to a harbor. So what he would say is that there's universal laws, your physics, right? In the laws of gravity and the gravitational pull, that's going to dictate the law of the tides. All right. So as we rotate through the month, the gravitational pull is going to change the way the tides are. And that's, that's independent. That's just, that's the pure logic of that situation. But the behavior of any particular harbor with respect to the laws of gravity and, 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 and tides is going to be a function of the way in which we've drawn the harbor, right? And the way we've, you know, if we, if we build it up too much on one side or the other side or whatever, we're going to shape it. And so economics is this play between the laws that are, it, are exact and the laws that are conditioned by these various different environmental factors. So the logic of choice must be met with the situational logic of this context and that that forges what we mean by economics. So when we think about, you know, the market economy, we're thinking about a world in which we have enforced and exchangeable property rights, right? In which we honor the, the rule of law and whatnot. So just to give a very broad context of this, Milton Friedman in 1979 goes to China and he's asked by everyone in China, Professor Friedman, what should we do? And he says, privatize, privatize, privatize. In 2006, he's asked, you know, Professor Friedman, have you ever rethought like what you said in China, privatize, 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 given the troubles that we've seen in transition and things like that? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Privatize, 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 provided there's a rule of law, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a huge difference. Now, the other question for people like me who are, go back to that earlier Rothbardian idea, who want to study uh, the endogenous evolution of the rules 
which govern the market. So I want to see this co-evolution outside the state. So I'm not waiting for a deus machina to tell me how the harbor, I'm actually seeing how the harbor is constructed and its interaction effect with the logic of choice. That's why I call it analytical anarchism, right? Is a study of endogenous rule formation. Uh, you know, when I'm looking at that, I'm not relying on the state to be the enforcer and developer and evolution of those property rights because market participants, in fact, can do those. So that's where I embrace the things like, for example, Benson's work on the law merchant or Leeson's work on anarchy unbound or any of that kind of stuff like that. Or the Ostroms. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, yeah. and that makes sense. Like, why is it that we would turn to the Ostroms? You know, like, again, they were part of the public choice tradition. They're very grounded in, in a recognition of Mises' calculation argument. That's a key aspect of understanding Vincent's work. But it wasn't like any other Austrians were tapping into those. But we did in our research group because we wanted to study endogenous rule formation. We look out in the world of scholarship, you know, besides Benson working on the, the law merchant, you know, who else is working on those things? Well, Eleanor and, and Vincent Ostrom were working on those things and the whole notion of polycentric governance. And so that made sense, especially given that we were studying transition economies, which in fact, by definition, meant that the rules were all torn asunder or failed in weak states, like after military conflict or whatever, or pre-develop, you know, pre-development economies. Or post-Katrina. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Favorite, well, that was the way that my we favorite work from, from the department. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So that, so it, within, we assume... It is kind of a, a crazy to me when I was first studying economics that it took so long or to get to someone like Jim Buchanan and Gordon Tullock to say, let's assume behavior <laughs> and see what happens. What, let's see what happens when the rules change. So the rules of politics versus the rules of the market. And so that's not, so the rules change as you sort of like the harbor changes and everything changes, but people are still behaving in the same general rational choice actor way. Um, and that, that kind of gets to this, this way in your, in the final essay of the book where, because you accept these things as facts of the world, um, it makes you in, in your term, pessimistically optimistic about the future, uh, and what's going to bring, because you're, you're not expecting humans to get significantly better, I guess, in, in some sense that they will still continue to make choices. So then we have to really focus on the rules, correct? Yeah. So the, the general mantra is same players, different rules produce different outcomes. And so you're trying to explain the variation of the outcomes, not by variation of people, right? So it's not because some people are dumb or others are smart or because, you know, some people have, you know, more skills and whatever. Obviously, in a many things in the world, Different people, same rules, produce different outcomes. So LeBron James simply can play basketball better than me, all right? But, uh, or if I said to you, you know, uh, you know, we're talking about the allocation of entrepreneurial talent. So, you know, we're talking about someone being in the NBA or someone being in the Kentucky Derby, right? And so then you say, Shaquille O'Neal you know, won the Kentucky Derby, that would seem really weird to you, right? Seven foot four riding on the back of a horse, just like- you know, not, a, not a typical right? jockey. Or, yeah. or if you said Willie Shoemaker was jumping center in the NBA, you know, five, you know, whatever, five foot one or whatever he was and a hundred pounds, right? So, you know, in that sense, the characteristic of the person does all the work for you. And to me, that is, a, that is not requiring a theory because what you're doing is it's just a description right? You're just saying, you know, good people do good things, bad people do bad things. Where theory comes in is when good people trying to do the best they can, you know, pave a, uh, you know, lead a path to hell or, you know, uh, greedy people or whatever, trying to do the best that they can end up by producing the invisible hand, right? And then those two things mean that we have to have a theory to explain it. And so that's what we're trying to do. So we're going to do the following. We're going to have same players and like basically just Freeze their preferences is what you're doing. Treating preferences is given. And then you're going to try to explain the variation in outcome by the variation in the institutions within which these people go. So again, to your re listeners that are more philosophical, this argument is really laid out in Nozick's first part of Anarchy, State, and Utopia, brilliantly, actually. Um, and uh, I think actually reading Nozick as an invisible hand theorist is a very important exercise because 
the beginning of the book is that way. The middle of the book, half of it is that way, process versus end states. The last of the book is all that way. So the only time in which Nozick is right as Trump's is one half of the argument against Rawls. Not, not, you know, it's not even the, the vast majority of the argument. So people have missed. And he got that. He got that from Roth, Rothbard. Yes. And, and so I think he's mis, yeah. I think he's misinterpreted a lot of times by friend and foe. But that's a whole other story for a different time. But um, I, I, but I think this idea of having an animating agent, an institutional filter, and then an equilibrating tendencies, that's our core theory. That's what I meant before by the logic of choice meets up with situational logic and then gives us this pattern that we then use as our theory to then ex- understand the world around us. So uh, so how do, things, how do things get better? How do so, things get better? So if we- this is the key issue, which is you're now not trying to change people. People are who they are. What you're trying to do is, is see about changing the ideas. Now, this is where McCloskey comes in, right? It's, it's, I, institutions are ultimately, they turn and, 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 and succeed or fail depending on their underlying legitimacy in the social and cultural zeitgeist of an age. Why? Because, to put it in econo speak, which, you know, maybe I is advantaged or not, but it, what it does is it raises or lowers the cost of enforcing of those institutions. So, you know, if, if my informal norms tell me that I should respect private property, I don't need to have a cop on every corner protecting private property, right? And so that's going to be the issue. It lowers that cost of having it. Therefore, we have more widespread suggestion of that. And so it's not the form of the institution in particular, it's the practice of the institution that is necessary. And so McCloskey is right to try to put a, a, a strong emphasis on ideas. It is ultimately all about ideas, but those ideas, in my opinion, she disagrees with this. Those ideas have to be instantiated in concrete institutions. And then those concrete institutions have their impact by structuring the incentives and generating the informational feedback loops that are necessary for the actors to learn how to adjust their behavior to one another to realize their goals. And, you know, those institutions are either going to hinder or hurt or, or help us realize that we do better by living together rather than we would apart. And that's a big part of my book is to try to say about the liberal project that we are we can't expect it to be where sharp objects in our social interactions disappear. We're always going to have cleavages and social differences and disagreements or whatever. What we're going to try to do is push those down to the most local level. When the, the disagreements and stuff are at the highest levels of government, it's very difficult to get responsible governance. But we push it down to more local levels, and then we dull the edges so that what happens is through our interactions, our decisions to exit, all those kind of things like that, to say no, but also to say yes, all of those interactions that we interact with, uh, that we engage in, uh, they end up by giving us cuts and bruises, but not deeply mortal wounds. What our problem, I would say today, is that a lot of our discourse has sharpened the sharp edges rather than dulled them. And so this has led to the situation now where a lot of our social engagements are at the edge of providing mortal wounds. And that's going to raise the cost of us realizing social gains from cooperation and living better together, you know, than we would apart. And so that's what leads to this issue. So, you know, I, when I chose the title of the book, um, you know, I was thinking of it in, in terms of two types of struggles. My struggle as a scholar to try to understand what's going on, but then also the struggle of the ongoing emancipatory project of liberalism, that liberalism is a revolution that's unfinished rather than something. So we're not trying to go backwards, right? Like you're never going backwards, you know, what the hell was it like, you know, to be a gay man in 1950, you know, my uncle was gay and, and, and unfortunately passed away in the first, you know, rounds of the, uh, uh, of the AIDS 
crisis, you know, and, and so he passed away before AZT and all that other stuff was around. But, you know, you know, what was life like for him coming out of World War II and, you know, the 1950s and 60s or whatever? You know, when I was a little kid growing up in the 1960s and getting closer to the 70s, my uncle became more and more flamboyant. You know, this, I'm, I just, you know, as a, you know, wore a more flamboyant dress and everything like that. He, he, you know, spent all the holidays with us, lived in New York City and came over um, and did all of that. And now in retrospect, I can understand why, because he was feeling now he could be kind of, you know, pockets of freedom in his life. You know, he could be free. He could be who he was as opposed to, you know, who he had to put a public face on because he was discriminated against at an earlier time. And so, you know, we, there's no back to go to. <laughs> There's only a future of, of greater and greater opportunities for the spread of liberal ideas. And I think that's the way that we should be presenting it. It's not that liberalism is hollow, right? That's one way to think about the project, you know, but when I read, like, say, Frederick Douglass's, you know, what is a slave, what is the 4th of July to a slave, you know, he's influenced in that by Lysander Spooner. People forget that. That's like a, a major influence of him. And he's not saying that the American Revolution is a sham. He's saying that the American Revolution is a hypocrisy because it's not fulfilled as it should be. And that's a different project. Saying that it's a sham is one thing. Saying that it's hypocritical and not consistent. And, and, and if you think about the abolitionist movement, that's what they wanted to put in your face, right? That's when they're saying, am I not a man? Am I not your sister, right? Am I not your brother? They're, they're making you, they're staring it in your face that you're just a hypocritical, you know, uh, uh, pain in the ass. And so this is the same thing when we think about today with regard to like immigration and open borders, when we think about, you know, trans and, and other sort of, you know, sexual uh, identities that people want to have and all these things like that. Liberalism should be a project that all of these groups understand as emancipatory, not as the potential blockers to their progress, but the vehicle by which they have the opportunity to have a free and flourishing life. And it's a, tra a tragedy to me that liberalism has been communicated in a way that doesn't attract the, the young and the dispossessed, right? And, and somehow it seems like we've, you know, pushed them to the side when actually, you know, it's all about lifting up the opportunities. I, I use a metaphor in the, in the book and I don't really, I, I'm not sure that it's the right metaphor, right? Um, which is that, um, you know, it, it, that, that, you know, the liberal introduction of markets is a hand reaching across to a stranger and welcoming them then into friendship, okay? But it's also in the process of doing that, it's in, its, in a certain way taking its hand and lifting up, right? But it's not lifting up under any kind of, you know, I'm the white man's burden, you know, lifting you up kind of idea because I'm, you know, the... the it, and, and so I don't know how the... Me I think the metaphor or the analogy might break down because that's... I'm not trying to say that I'm... that it's only because of our hand that we can lift you up because the lifting up is done by you, right? It's it's you being an entrepreneur. Well, it's it's, mutu it's yeah. mutual too. It's yeah. mutual. But it's this this yeah. this notion of catalaxy of turning a stranger into a friend that's a critical aspect about realizing these social cooperation and division of labor. And, you know, the, you know, <laughs> it, it just amazes me that we don't live by the values of the openness to an opportunity economy, inviting people in and saying, you know, come here and flourish, you know, uh, cause when we look around us, all we see is people who, you know, came from all over parts of the world that have made our lives better off because they've come here and, and been able to have the freedom to be able to come up with better goods and services or better ways to deliver the goods and services to us. And so again, you know, our, our uh, tremendous material well-being is a function of this ultimate resource, the human imagination and the freedom of individuals to be able to pursue productive specialization and realize social, peaceful social cooperation through exchange. And so the, the book is, you know, a series of lectures 
that I was had given the opportunity to give over a period of the 2000s. And this is the theme that I wanted to keep coming back and communicating to people. When I became president of MPS, you know, I did this deep dive. I'm an academic, so I'm, you know, a, a nerdy type. So, you know, I did this whole history of MPS and all these different things like that. And I went back to the original documents and the original purpose. And I'm trying to capture those things and say, like, this is what, you know, we're all about. You people that think it's about, you know, somehow, uh, you know, a neoliberal, you know, cabal or whatever, you've missed the whole picture about what it is that we're trying to, to engage in. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean... And so that's the, that's the history that I tell. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us in Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.